It's really good to be with you. We're the two from Utah, so uh, travel a little ways to be out here. It's really good to be with you guys in New York. Um, I was actually just here uh, a couple of weeks ago uh, on a layover. I took a trip down to down to uh, the World Trade Center area. That was awesome. It's really good to be back um, and see some view that I saw at the Selenium Conference just a couple of weeks ago. Our talk um, that we're going to be giving today. Massively continuous integration is something that we've been sharing with groups um, here in the U.S. and overseas this year. Um, it's a case study. What we want to tell you about is our experience with using Jenkins and using the cloud to transform our organization. Um, and we wouldn't be able to do that, come share this stuff with you, if it weren't for our sponsors. So um, we appreciate, of course, CloudBees for putting the whole thing on. And then those that are providing resources to allow us to get together as a community. My name is Jess Stoudel. Uh, I direct the engineering efforts uh, at the company that we work for called AtTask. Um, we're an agile company. We've, we've been doing uh, software as a service for, for years and years. And um, so technologies like, like continuous integration are, are in our DNA. And uh, I work to help drive both the, the product itself forward as well as the technologies and processes that allow us to be successful. Um, you might notice the name on the, your program is, is for David Tolley and Joel Johnson's here. David and Joel are our are, are CI gurus. They're on our, our continuous integration team. Um, their, their job is 100% full time to help AtTask deploy successfully using continuous integration using Jenkins and other tools in our tool chain. So, um, he's going to be talking as well about some of the more technical aspects of our particular Jenkins implementation. Um, but as I mentioned, AtTask is a software as a service company. This is our office. Um, we like it out there. We enjoy the, the weather and the, the four seasons and getting to go ski, have ski days and in the winter and mountain biking in the summer. It's a good place to build software. Um, we're in the project management <coughs> software space. So uh, that means everything from big, you know, waterfall-esque, multi-year projects, oil and gas projects, financial planning types of things, as well as more IT-centric development, like demand-generated, request-driven queues. Um, and we do, we've recently been exploring something called collaborative work management, which is basically the, the integration of social in the workspace. So everything from your your individual team collaboration tools, like you might see with Basecamp or um, <coughs> version one, all the way up to enterprise level dashboards and reports. That's kind of the, the space that we're in. And we have about 70 developers um, spread across nearly a dozen strong teams. So not a huge company, but we're a, an established one. And we have some interesting and unique challenges in our space in that instead of selling into the consumer world, we're, we're selling into the business world. Um, it's enterprise software, and so um, our need to develop with a high degree of quality and reliability and to carefully manage change is an important part of our success, and sometimes that can run counter to um, the continuous deployment principles that a lot of people are talking about right now. Um, so in order to tell you our story, I have to describe for you where we've been. I mentioned that we're an Agile shop. We've been doing development with automated testing for a long time, um, but we haven't always been really effective at it. Uh, when we first got going with automation, we relied a lot on scripted scenario tests. We used Selenium really heavily, and, and actually we still do. Uh, but our tests tended to be kind of slow and brittle and prone to fail. We didn't have a great CI system in place. In fact, we had multiple CI tools. Um, we had our own hand-rolled one. We had an, an installation of Jenkins, and we had Team City as well, rolling in different departments. Um, and it usually took somewhere in the neighborhood of three to five days to do the acceptance portion of our release cycle. So you know, we'd ship software monthly, and then every single month we'd have to send it off to a, to a QA acceptance process that would take sometimes up to a week. With the system that we have in place now, which we're going to tell you about, our UI tests operate much more like unit tests or integration tests. And we'll show you how we've been able to accomplish that. They're much faster to execute and they're less prone to break. We're shipping software into production every single day now. And instead of multiple CI tools, multiple sources of truth, we've 
We've standardized around Jenkins and have deployed it wall to wall in our organization. In fact, there are aspects of our Jenkins install that are used by our support team, our product team, and our, even our marketing teams. So it's, it's really become uh, a, a core piece of what we do with AtTask. And it, it does take about 30 to 45 minutes now to certify a release for production, which is an amazing, uh, it has been an amazing transformation for us. So when I talk about continuous integration, this is basically what I mean. We've got a version control system of some kind um, that, with, that code flows into, and that version control system connects with the build server that compiles the code and makes sure that that's going to work properly right up front. This is you know, Jenkins' bread and butter. If it's successful, you get an application stack. The test runner then runs both unit tests, which it can just run in memory or whatever right there locally, and may also run integration tests or UI tests against the application stack. And then there must be some sort of notification mechanism that aggregates the results of those test runs and broadcasts them, whether it's through email or Jabber or, or whatever else it might be. Um, so we, we consider this the basic template for uh, a, a good continuous integration system. Oh, I forgot that step. Yeah, you've got to reset it at the end so that it can accept the new, the next commit, the next thing that comes in. So the number of tests that we're running right now, I think these numbers are out of date. They've grown pretty significantly. Um, we have a few thousand tests, API unit, um, UI tests, but it's not really the number of tests we have, it's how often we're running them. We're running, I think last month we did just shy of 60,000 machine hours worth of tests. Um, and that's because we're running all of those tests both for release acceptance and for continuous integration. When we, when we embarked on this project of moving from our old continuous integration system to this new one, we had to ask ourselves some pretty hard questions. Um, I don't know if any of you have read the book Continuous Delivery. It's a, published by ThoughtWorks. Anybody heard of that book or has read it? Some hands go up. Go up. Um, you know, I sat in a talk by one of the authors of that book, and he had a litmus test for continuous integration that I thought was interesting. He said, how many of you develop on feature branches? And some of us raised our hands. He said, okay, you are not continuously integrated. Whoa, shocking, okay. Cool, okay, so we're on master. And then he said, okay, how, how often do you run your tests? Well, uh, we run our tests every checking. Well, which ones? Well, our unit tests, of course. Well, what about all the other ones? What about your web tests? What about your performance tests? Well, we run those when it's time to release. Okay, you're not continuously integrated. Really, the question is, what do I need to know in order to release? What, what does our business need to know about the quality of the code in order to release? And do we know that continuously? The key is that every commit is a potential release candidate. That's what continuous integration ultimately means. And, and anything that's short of that, while still useful, is a step short of true continuous integration. So to get to that, you, you need a big, hairy, audacious goal, a BHAG. It's, it's not something that most organizations are prepared to absorb right up front, and we certainly weren't. But we were able to bucket all of our aspirations and goals for what we wanted to accomplish into a few main categories. We knew performance was something we were going to have to dramatically improve. I mean, one of the reasons that we didn't run all of our tests every check-in is because it took hours to get the results. You know, it sometimes takes six or seven hours just to run all the tests. Um, the corollary to that performance is that we're going to need some massive scale. Another, another problem that we had, and one of the reasons why we, we needed to make a change is because our engineering team lacked visibility into the quality of the code they were actually submitting. I mean, they're running their unit tests. We had the ability to run any kind of local tests that we wanted, but a developer might break something in the web application, and it would be two weeks before the next full Selenium suite run came through. And by then, it, so much time had passed that not only was it really difficult to determine root cause, but it was really challenging to hold the engineer accountable. I don't know if you've ever tried to go to a developer and say, you know, three weeks ago, you wrote that line of code that broke this test. <laughs> They're way past that by then, right? If they even remember the line of code at all. So we took these, these, four, um, you know, these four goals and started whiteboarding out what we thought our continuous deployment pipeline or continuous integration system would look like. And this is ultimately what we came up with and what we've implemented 
and Joel's going to talk to you about some of the details of each of these steps. Like I was describing before, it all starts with a commit, or in our case, a, a push. Um, as soon as that happens, Jenkins immediately begins spinning up jobs in parallel. We build out our at task application stack uh, as an installer. We use yum for this, commonly used. And we also package up all of the test files um, that, that we need to run in a single, a single distributable file. We use just, I think, a zip for this. At the same time that we're building at task and building our test files, we reach out into the cloud and we begin spinning up infrastructure. We're going to need a whole bunch of infrastructure to run all of these tests in a timely fashion. So we've got to create an at task application and a whole bunch of Selenium resources as well. While the at task uh, installer is being sent out to the cloud and is updating and configuring that infrastructure, we use Jenkins slaves to run our unit tests and our integration tests. Once the installation is complete and the application stack is prepared, um, we again use Jenkins and send commands out against those remote servers. We run our Selenium suite comprehensively in both Internet Explorer and Firefox at the same time, as well as other tests that require an application stack. And then when that's, when that's done, we aggregate all the results back in through Jenkins, back to the master node, and we send the kill command out to the cloud to <coughs> reap, just tear down all that infrastructure and be ready to start again. So uh, at, at, with this, I think we'll turn the time over to Joel. All right. So we wanted to take a few minutes, give you a break, and remind you how to make a paper airplane. So there you go. No, um, so if I had a stack of papers and gave it to a, one of these gentlemen over here and took the same number of papers and gave it to the whole side of the room over here, who do you think would be able to make the most airplanes fastest? Obvious answer, these guys would be able to go faster than one guy. So that's uh, in a nutshell queuing theory, right? The more you have to work, the faster it's going to go. Uh, nothing new here, right? And so, with that in mind, we realized, well, when we run these jobs, we need to do as much as we possibly can in parallel. Uh, that's scaling horizontally. Uh, so, uh, to illustrate how we divided it up, basically we said, which jobs can run independent of each other? And we run those at the same time. Pretty straightforward. Uh, the effect is obvious. I mean, if you're running uh, serially, the runtime is end to end, how long it takes this plus this plus this to run. You parallelize it, uh, it's now become the length of the longest uh, job to run. So again, there, this isn't rocket science, it's basic uh, stuff here. So we decided we, would, we needed a tool to do this. Like Jesse mentioned, we were actually running a number of uh, tools uh, before. These aren't all the ones we were running. We were just running a few, but these were our options, obviously. We finally settled on Jenkins. Uh, we had had some experience with it, and the community was awesome, and we were really excited to get involved with that, so we decided to go with the open solution here, so that's why we're here now. Uh, we also wanted a way to resolve this issue where uh, I mean, we only have so many computers in the office. You can only run so many jobs at the same time. Uh, so we needed to resolve that. We decided we'd go to a cloud vendor. Uh, we had a lot of options. We actually settled for Amazon Web Services. Uh, we liked their API. We liked a lot of the plugins that Jenkins already had made, so we could just jump in head first. Uh, so there it was, Amazon, Jenkins, Mad Task, Match Made in Heaven. Uh, so kind of go over uh, how we do this real quick is so git we commit we push it gets queued up uh, Jenkins takes a look at the, the queue uh, he starts accepting uh, jobs realizes he's run out of machines to run these on so he using the EC2 plugin that was already available in the plugin repo for Jenkins uh, some of you might have used it already uh, Jenkins will just look and say, oh, I need a computer with these tags. Uh, and using the Amazon EC2 API, it'll start a machine up on the fly for us to use. 
that slave will then run that job, do everything necessary. Uh, however many jobs we need. I'll show you uh, an example. There are times where we'll have a dozen Amazon machines running. Uh, and when those are finally done, Jenkins will look at that and say, okay, I'm done. Uh, and then take those away. Pretty straightforward. If you've used this plugin before, you've seen how it works. Um, it's actually really cool. It works really well for us. We rarely have jobs stuck in the queue. We rarely have machines sitting around doing nothing. So we wanted to be able to uh, do a couple things here. To be able to take our test suite to massive scale run tests uh, consistently. If one person checks in at the same time as somebody else, we don't want to wait for the first one to finish before we start the next one. Um, also, Jesse mentioned we use Selenium, we use Selenium Grid, we use, uh, we test against a live at task server. We wanted to be able to uh, deploy those to Amazon really quick. So, uh, a couple things with uh, testing. So, to speed up our tests, uh, we did a few things. Uh, we separated a lot of, this is a standard practice, really. You, you know, you separate your code out into separate modules. You're, that way you're able to test separately. Uh, they're independent of each other. Uh, also, we made our test suite able to shard the test out, the test suite out. So we could say one machine, run the first half, or run the first quarter of the test suite. To another machine, you run the next quarter, and so forth. That way, we even do this with a lot of our API tests because there's so many. We distribute those out across four different machines, as you see there at the bottom of the the integration tests right there. So uh, that gives us the ability to, if we on a busy week decide we need to run faster, we can easily just by tweaking our ant target properties and say run 10 uh, jobs at the same time. Uh, so going back to this graphic, I mean we have several different types of tests. If you don't mind interrupting you, how do you do the showing you? Does the test kernel help you, or do you? Yeah, so we use JUnit4. Uh, JUnit4 gives you a lot of, uh, like, with the different runners and everything. Uh, you're able to, uh, with a lot of hackery, uh, I can show you if you want um, offline how we did it, but uh, we were able to set it up, and so it generates a whole suite of tests and gathers those with, after applying all the filters and then we just take that list of tests and uh, create sublists and then whatever the property is specified in ant it takes that section of the tests and runs them. So one thing that's really cool on that is if you do like a multi-configuration job you, you can use like an ant property to define what slice you want yeah, and then you can do multi-config across the slices and it'll automatically spit out, you know, 10 different jobs and then aggregate the results for right. a, in the parent job. So you, you do that by custom runners? Yeah, using custom runners and doing it for. Yeah. Thank you. And also we have several different types of tests. So tests that require the database, tests that can run in memory, tests that require an email server up, uh, tests that require the U, UI. We separate those out as well. That, that was an obvious decision there. Um, so I, I, it required a lot of changes for us to be able to implement this, this type of thing. We had a lot of the, the groundwork in, um, but to say it was easy and it happened overnight would be a lie. I mean, it's, we've been working on this and we're constantly improving. We've been working on this for about six months now, uh, the transition to uh, make this work. Before, Jesse was talking about uh, how we use Selenium. We were, and still are, and we're transitioning away from being as dependent as we are on Selenium tests. Uh, somebody got bit by the UI testing bug several years ago and decided to write tons of tests using Selenium. Um, and it took three days to run those tests. That didn't take three days itself, but then to go through all the tests, find which ones were legitimate bugs, find which ones were just test failing because it, something changed on the UI, a, a CSS select change, whatever. We had before about 1,800 tests uh, written in Selenium 1. Um, and just to run it once, it took about four hours. It was slow, it was brittle, like I mentioned. 
Um, we need a, a change. So here on the left, we have our old Selenium 1 test. That was just a portion of one test. It looks like they took Selenium IDE, hit record, started clicking like mad, spit it out into a JUnit test, and kept it. <laughs> it was awful. <laughs> so we uh, adopted Selenium 2. We decided we would approach it more in a unit test style. Uh, Selenium 2 offers you the page pieces. Uh, you approach it more in an object-oriented way. You actually think about the test as you're writing it. Uh, if something breaks, you just go into the page piece, change it there, and it fixes all the tests that were dependent on that. Um, we were able to break it up. We wrote 750 of these tests. They ran way faster. It took about 30 minutes to run. Obvious question, what happened to the, all the other tests? So, first thing we did was we went through and tried to find duplicate code. We deleted tests we didn't need anymore. Second of all, we were in the fortunate circumstance where we were and still are rewriting the majority of our user interface for at task. So we still actually run those 1,800 tests, not on every check-in, but on about every hour. Uh, and then with the Selenium 2 tests, we only test what we need to test very specifically uh, for the new user interface. So the Selenium 2 suite we actually run as part of our continuous delivery, or mm -hmm. continuous integration. Uh, those get run every check-in. So before, it took about two minutes to run a single test in Selenium. Selenium 2 takes about 30 seconds. Uh, and then we farm those out across Selenium Grid. Uh, takes A test would finish about every eight seconds with Selenium 1. Now we have a test finishing about every two and a half seconds. So, obviously, the solution is a lot faster, um, and we are finding as our test suite grows that uh, it's actually uh, maintaining the space pretty well. Um, so, our Amazon solution we use uh, to deploy at test, we use uh, an Amazon uh, cloud formation, that's the word, sorry. So, the cloud formations, if you've ever used this, you give it a JSON file that describes your stack. Um, here's an example. You say the size of the machine you need to run, what kind of machines, uh, Linux, Windows, whatever, which MI or image you want to use, and it launches it up. So going back here, kind of how this all ties together, we use that on this step here to create our Selenium grid and all the machines it needs to run and then also at task with an Oracle database, whatever else we need. So, we've got back to Jenkins running, we get a request, and Amazon starts raining down machines. So, each, we start up two uh, Selenium grid service, uh, servers. Uh, each have eight RCs connected to it. Firefox, we were able to do that with just two machines. Internet Explorer is, well, Internet Explorer and required us to start up eight separate machines. Uh, and then at task, we have another machine running at task with the database and everything. The cool thing about this approach is we can do this. So we run the tests against them, they go normal. Cool thing is, is we could do this as many times as we want. So I commit, my tests are running, Jesse commits, starts up another uh, set of um, machines to run. And they run independent of each other, obviously. They run fast. This gives us the ability to run uh, the entire test suite, including our UI Selenium tests, for every single push. Uh, we do probably about a dozen every hour. Uh, sometimes more, just depending on what's going on. Uh, the switch to Jenkins gave us a few, and also one of our primary goals was accountability for breaking tests. Uh, when we first switched to Jenkins, we had a lot of problems. Joel, I committed. What did I break? Where is it? How do I find it? Uh, there was a lot of clicking involved uh, natively, so uh, we, uh, we decided to uh, dabble in our um, programming skills a little bit and started writing some Jenkins plugins. 
So this is uh, our Jenkins instance. Uh, when we first set it up, one of our UI developers got a little excited <coughs> and started styling things. So, sorry, but that's how it is. So, one thing you'll notice, let me uh, show you here. This is live, uh, back at home where everybody else is working. Uh, the first plugin we wrote was a simple plugin. It just sets the description of the build as it comes in. So Git checks out the repository and sets the description of the build to whatever we specify. So, oh man, not logged in. Quick question. Yeah. Are you guys uh, queuing check ins? So, or are you going with each and every check in that you're, you're pulling off and starting? So, it, we pull on a one minute interval. Okay. So, if two people commit in the same minute, they get grouped together. I'll show you how we handle that. So, you're going to laugh at me. I joke. I was joking around one day when I had to change my password. And I wanted to see how long it would let my password be, and I've been too lazy to change it. So. <laughs> It's a little embarrassing. <laughs> All right, so they're in. Um, so if we go in here, so the, dis the plug this description plugin is really basic. It's, not, it's nothing fancy, but just to show you. You just say down here, set description, whatever variables you want. So we set it to just show the branch, revision, author. The plugin also fetches that information as well, anything that wasn't there. Um, so. Like you saw, that's what it looks like. And then the next thing is we wanted to see every job for that revision. So built a, a pretty simple view plugin that applies a custom regular expression looking for descriptions and will match jobs up based off of what it matches on that regular expression. So you see here, we've got our unit tests, what we call our local tests, which are like API tests and everything. Um, and then our, these are our remote tests. So our Seleniums and like email tests and different things. So these all have the same description set according to whatever the plugin was specified. So um, this way a developer can just log into our server, ci.attest.com, hit enter, pull it up, and they immediately see what they're looking for. If I had committed today, you would actually have the line highlighted so I can easily find my commit. Uh, the question was asked, do we group these together? Yeah, every once in a while a test will get grouped, or a revision will get grouped with another one. That's what this icon means. You can click on it, it'll pop up. All the revisions included. Uh, you can see the commit information. It pulls that from the first job listed. So it just jumps into that job, pulls it through. Uh, from what, uh, whatever. So, so basically, you guys have a um, single entry point to the CI system, right? Yep. And pull every, I mean, all the repositories, all actually, maybe one single repository for you guys, but all the chains for that. Yep. And so, if you want to look like the out of view here, we'll let you specify which columns you want to see, and then a regular expression. And so, this is kind of, it looks like madness, but it's pretty simple. It just needs to match this pattern. And then you can give it a group. I put a group on the revision. And then you could just say which group you want to designate that as unique. So the descriptions can be somewhat different. But as long as they match on that revision, then they'll be on the same row, if that makes sense. Hopefully that makes sense. But uh, And then there's different features. It, just, it shows the failure. So as you can see, We've got a few Selenium tests that are still failing. Um, and this. There was a question. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Is this public? Public available? Or is it, it is public. Uh, Git. I have got it in my own Git repository. I have not added it to yours yet, yeah, but I have plans to do so. <laughs> <laughs> Real quick. I mean, the thing that's amazing about this. It, I mean, there's so much flexibility. If you want to create a view that is every commit that whoever's logged in has created, you can just create that view. If you want one that's just for a specific branch, you just do that branch. By using a regular expression to match on whatever part of the description you care about, you have almost unlimited flexibility in terms of how the jobs are displayed. And for us, you know, we, we experimented with other pipeline views, but it's, 
you'll, you know, you'll find if you just traverse the upstream and downstream jobs, inevitably there's a bunch of stuff that people just don't care that much about, right? The rigging, like the glue jobs between the stuff that matters. And so by using a view like this, you get all of that out of the way of your engineers, and they can get right in and just like you said, single entry point, right? See exactly what they need to see, um, and it's just brain dead easy. So uh, both of these are simple plugins, but we found that working together, that it's pretty powerful. Uh, and going back to accountability, this alone increased the accountability of our developers uh, a huge amount. Uh, I mean, we talked about those old Selenium tests that took forever to run and were always failing and we never knew what they meant. We run those on an hourly timer here in this far right corner. And even those have just sitting there and being exposed like this has um, increased the quality of uh, those test results. They, they're not perfect by any means, but they run just about as well as our new tests, ironically. So, I mean, just exposing accountability and having the ability to run the whole suite like this on, on demand for however number of revisions has increased the quality of our builds. Uh, so it's been really exciting for us. Uh, another one we wanted, so like I said, we're currently transitioning from heavy UI test suite to more standard unit tests. That doesn't happen overnight, it takes a long time. So we needed more visibility into uh, what's failing. So we added a, well, Selenium provides the ability to take screenshots. So using uh, uh, JUnit 4, uh, whenever Selenium test fails, so using a JUnit rule, it takes a screenshot. This simple plugin just uh, will let you see the screenshots in line with the test that's failing. So a developer can come in and see what the browser looked like when the test failed. And this, I mean, we, we see there's about 10 tests failing, or six. Before, we, we were hovering around 20. We had no idea what was going on. We had run the test locally. Uh, this gave us the ability to see what was happening, and we were able to fix a lot of unknown failures pretty quick, just with this simple thing. And that's, to me, uh, shows how powerful Jenkins can be with these plugins. And they allow you to model what it's doing to what you want to be doing, rather than being constrained to what the tool is giving you. So, we had screenshots just in case we weren't able to connect. We also use uh, test history a lot. Uh, when tests are failing off and on throughout the day, um, it's nice to see if that test is bad. I mean poorly written, which you can see if the test is failing, passing, failing, passing, failing, uh, it's in code that's not hardly even changing, you know something's wrong with that test. Um, another thing, back to accountability again, we're in the process of uh, writing and improving another plugin that we're hopefully going to be able to make public to you guys here soon. Uh, so uh, Jesse was explaining, at task, the product is uh, project management. You create a project add tasks to it, add issues, whatever. We use that as our, our bug tracking system in, internally. Uh, we created a plugin uh, that syncs Jenkins results with at task. So if a test fails five revisions ago, uh, let's see, it's actually not running on these Selenium tests. So. Find some locals that are broken. Oh, there's yes. Somebody broke the build, thank you. <laughs> I never thought I would say those words. <laughs> so, it's not perfect. Um, so we're still trying to improve it, make it load faster. Um, but it adds this assign to column. It'll try to auto assign the user when the test fails. Um, it, it knows, it remembers by syncing with that task. So if it fails in this revision and then in five revisions before that user is able to see that it failed. I mean, we run so many revisions, it could be a matter of five, 10 minutes before another commit fixes that test. Um, this will tell you, it'll gray it out, and that's why it's gray, um, because the test is passing now. Uh, we can assign it to a person, it'll send them a notification on that task or email, however you want it to be, uh, that they've been assigned to that. Uh, you can just drop down on this drop down menu and assign it to whomever, so. And then we can uh, jump over to at task. Excuse me. 
Do they get a notification when they're assigned? Yes, they do. Okay. Um, we moved all the notifications out of Jenkins because Attask has a lot more granular controls over those emails. So by pushing the tickets into Attask and then letting their credentials there handle it, that actually simplified a lot of things because people were getting blind to Jenkins daemon emails, uh, but they, they pay more attention to the ones coming from our tool. So whenever a test fails, um, Crow T robot here will, excuse me, come in and update the task, the issue here, and <coughs> notify. So we could even come in here and see history. We could see Michael Bright uh, accepted that as work. Um, and then that one scroll down to go for a while. Yeah. 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 All the way back into April. So you know, if your if your jobs are dropping off, I don't know if you if you're like us and you run this many builds, you have to have some kind of cap on the number of builds that you keep in the history. So ours fall off after about three days. But with this, it keeps it keeps the same ticket alive and reopens it and adds to its history. So you can actually trace back through for a period of months and see everybody that's broken that test, when they broke it, how long it was broken for, um, and it gives you a good sense of of which tests are your problem children, even if it's a long period of time. And, and one of the nice things about this is that, uh, so if five people commit within five minutes of each other, you've got five runs finishing. The first one finishes, and the fifth guy comes in and sees that there's tests failing, but in the first revision that was committed, somebody has accepted that as their fault and have been able to say, I'm working on this, it's fixed, just wait for my revision, and then they can wait for that revision to come in and make sure it's fixed. So there's rarely ever the question now, oh, this test failed, is this my fault? Now it's, oh, shoot, this was my fault. Um, and that has made us be able, our, our release process has changed with all these things. I mean, each unit of what we're explaining here seems very simple, very straightforward. Putting all these things together, has drastically changed, as Jesse explained, from four days, literally, we're not exaggerating here, it would take us the entire last week of a sprint to figure out if we can even release. Now, we open up Jenkins, scroll down until we see a build we like, uh, copy this revision, and send it over to IT and say, we're deploying this today. And we deploy it. it it's awesome, so. <laughs> So, um, pictures. Uh, a couple other things we did, just kind of going to dwell on this, but um, we also have other things. We're using Jenkins not just for running tests. We're using it as a platform, as a central hub for everything we do. Uh, a lazy developer can go in, click a button, and revert a commit now. Uh, they can go in and cherry pick a revision from master to uh, another branch, or vice versa. Uh, we've got code coverage running on Jenkins. Uh, we're working on implementing a code review system with Jenkins. Uh, it's, uh, the, we're not ending here. There's so many things we can do to make this awesome. And Jenkins is the central part of making all this possible. So Jesse's going to pick up from here. Yeah, I mean, one of the biggest challenges once you decide to move in this direction is to, t to sell the business on the fact that CI. It means continuous integration, but it also means continuous investment. You know, if, the, if your code base is going to evolve over time, and you're adding to it every single day, your continuous integration system has to be able to evolve along with it. And that means that there are some costs. Um, I'm just going to go over these really quickly because I think it's important to recognize those costs, but sell, you know, sell your, your boss, or if you're the guy that gets to make the decision, great, sell you on the value add that this really is. At AtTask, we created a CI team. We have Joel and David, and their job is to make Jenkins awesome. So all of the stuff that you've seen is their work and everything else we've got in the pipeline. I think the screenshotting was like two or three weeks ago that went in. So we're, we're constantly investing there. And we also, you know, you have to pay the piper when it comes to the infrastructure. 60,000 hours of machine time every month doesn't come cheap. So. Um, there are ways to keep the cost down by sizing the machines, making sure that when you tear down, you don't leave any orphaned computers behind, leave the meter running. Um, but just to do some quick back of the napkin math, 
Um, let's say that it took five days, that's what we've been saying, to certify a release, and we use 10 testers. Um, if we just pretend that they make 40 bucks an hour, that's about 20 grand worth of human capital to get that one release certified. If we do that in 30 minutes using an almost entirely automated system, we'll even pretend that we're gonna pay those 10 engineers just to watch Jenkins go green, right? <laughs> um, it's gonna cost about 250 bucks. Now, if you, if you take the fixed costs of the engineers that we're now paying full time to make Jenkins awesome, and the bill that we pay to Amazon every month, or that's annual, about what our annual budget is for EC2, it's going to cost about the same amount to certify 12 builds. Now we're, we're not talking about all the other huge advantages that we've been describing to you. We'll even pretend that it's just in a vacuum, you know, certifying releases. It's about the same for 12, 12 releases a year. Where it starts to get really interesting is when you want to release more than that. Because if you've got to do 24 of them in a year, your costs double in the old model. It's human capital, you've got to invest more per release. With an automated system like this, it's almost exactly the same price. If you get to a point where you're starting to think about continuous delivery, like we are, and you're, you're shipping uh, features into production almost every day, say 100 times a year, using the old model, well, first of all, there aren't even 100 weeks in the year, right? So we wouldn't, we wouldn't have been able to do it. Um, there aren't enough hours in the day. It's not even like a, a saying. It's literally, there aren't enough hours um, to do 100 deployments a year if it takes you a week to certify. That would have cost two million bucks, or thereabouts. With uh, the system that we put in place now, our forecast is that it's gonna cost about a tenth of that. If uh, you're fortunate enough to be in an industry or be in a business that sees value in moving to continuous delivery, this is how you accomplish it. You get the cloud involved and you scale up all of your testing. You move horizontally with your tests so that you can run everything that you need to run in order to certify a build in an automated fashion with a tight enough cycle time to drive improvement in your process. Um, these are some of, the, some of the areas that we're continuing to, to move forward with. We're, we're coming to this conference just right mid-step as we progress through this experience going to continuous delivery. Um, you know, our infrastructure and the, the deployment phase is the next part that we're gonna tackle. And uh, the talk that, uh, was it Andrew? Anyway, the talk earlier today talking about deployment is kind of the, the other side of this equation, how to get your, your certified build out into production. Um, and there are a lot of good open source tools for that. We're gonna continue to, to work with Jenkins, though I think we've, we've hitched ourselves to this wagon. So um, some of the plugins we talked about today, uh, Pipeline and Description Setter, the at test plugin, those are ours wholly, but we've also made contributions uh, for example, to the CloudFormation plugin, one of the things that you've got to do in order to, to build a system like this is parameterize your formation names. That's, that's something that we added to that, uh, to that plugin recently, or as part of this project. Um, and Joel, I think you've got a bunch more plugins, don't you? Stuff that hasn't been published yet, but we're... Things I play around with are on my GitHub account there. Okay, so if you're interested in following Joel, Joel on his GitHub, it's Joel J is his GitHub, and he's got a bunch of different plugins. We've even got a templating one. Watch out, Cloud Bees. <laughs> <laughs> um, here's some further reading. Uh, if you want the deck, these are great books. And uh, so with that, we thank you. So I'm um, talking about the single um, entry point, and uh, I'm working for Yahoo, and we have this big team, and so we have different packs in, um, responsible for the different components, for example, the front end and back end. So what we're doing is like a different team have their own com um, commit job or component job to, to run that. So um, is there any evaluation like uh, which one is better? And it looks like because I'm thinking. In our way, we're going to do the single entry point. We have to do some very smart logic to, to find out like, which part I change and which unit has to act on. So, many problem in your know, case. So, so, you have to smart to find out like uh, which unit has to act to run in, in that component and which part of the um, component is the organization that has or some other test I need to run. So, um, right now, it's pretty just uh, 
this job runs this ant target, and there's no brains beyond that. Um, we have talked about doing stuff like making it smarter, like, oh, this code changed, so run this portion of the code. Right now, we are not doing that, but that, that's definitely an option to improve runtime and to end run speed. Mm -hmm. Did I, does that answer your question? Did I understand you right? Sorry. Yeah, yeah, right. So I, I think you guys have depends on the end and to figure out the change. And yeah. Yeah, and, and in terms of what you display on that view, it's whatever that that committer has the potential to, to impact, right? So if you're in, an, in a large organization and you have well-encapsulated systems that don't affect each other, you don't necessarily have to drive visibility for your back-end team into what the, the front-end guys are checking in, right? So it kind of depends on your organization. At AppTask, we... Our model's a little like Facebook. We have a, a monolithic application, and the developers are full-stack developers for the most part. So they do need insight into what's going on up and down the stack. Uh, yeah? Yeah, uh, just wondering how you deal with the uh, database updates, uh, mm -hmm. especially rollbacks. That one's always tricky. I was just wondering <laughs> if you use Jenkins for that. That's an awesome question. One of the awesome things about this is we snapshot the machine at a certain database version. And so if the test runs, fails, and gets reverted, uh, the next test that runs uses that original image. And so it doesn't even have that DB upgrade anymore. And so we don't have to even worry about that. We've really got two places where that comes into play. The, the slave that runs the local integration tests, those persist all day long, right? EC2, where we spin them up, and then they probably live most of the workday because the plugin has like a 30 minute timeout and there's always another job coming in before the, the save dies. So those have to manage switching branches and this, this system deals with that. But the stuff that's in the cloud is, is even easier because it all gets reaped at the end of the, the run anyway. See, there's, there's no need to restore state. You just nuke the machines and then start new ones up for the very next run. In fact, we ran into problems with Amazon initially throttling us because they're not used to starting up hundreds of machines and tearing down hundreds of machines in the same hour. Um, but once they eased off on the caps, it, it worked really well. There was a question, green shirt, yeah. Uh, I was curious how you handled the, um, you mentioned you had a lot of jobs running in parallel. I was wondering how you do that. In, I know you can kick off the jobs, do you, do you bring them back in? Mm -hmm. um, Parameterized yeah, trigger plugin. About how you the parallels. Parameterized trigger plugin is the one we use for that. We experimented with join for a while, right? Yeah. And then uh, for test results, like that local test, that was the name of the job, it splits off into four separate jobs. So we use a parameterized trigger plugin to run those, and then we fetch the JUnit XML results file and um, use all four of those in the upstream job to display the overall result, if that makes sense. Um, does that so the, the build steps at the, 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 um, the upstream <coughs> job waits for? Yeah, and so the upstream job waits for all its uh, these. So the parameterized trigger plugin lets you trigger other jobs and wait for them to finish. Um, and then when, so the one test local triggers four of them, or however many, and then waits. And then when all four of them finish, it pulls all the results and displays them all as if it ran. So here we go right here. So as a build step, we call builds on other projects, one, two, three. We block, so we're gonna run all of those. And then we have artifacts that we're gonna pull from those downstream jobs. And then pass in parameters, right? Those artifacts to copy is actually an at task. Oh, this is, an at, this is a Joel plugin too? Yeah, I extended that. Okay, so we've... Have you pushed that to parameterize trigger? I don't think so. Okay, so we probably need to push that. Uh, but yeah, so it, it's, it, it works beautifully. And it, the end result is that from a developer's perspective, that job, test local, is the job. Right? They don't see any of the guts of it. Um, they just see a one unified test result file um, that, they, that they, again, we integrate with that task so that all feeds into their issue tracking system that they're used to. Cool. Guess it's lunchtime. Thanks, guys. Thank you.